It's good to be with you all. It's an honor to be here. I know speakers are supposed to say that, but I do mean it. Um, I don't think uh, Brother Jeff knows what high esteem I hold him in, but I do. Uh, Jonathan Edwards once preached a sermon. I don't remember the title of it, but it was something to the effect of that when God wishes to bless a people, he sends them a man of God in their midst. And uh, I want you to know you're blessed. Men like your pastor are hard to find. We will be looking at Second Chronicles 14, 11. We'll really be focusing on that particular uh, verse as well as Second Chronicles 16, 12. These are both kind of bookends of the life of King Asa, and they represent uh, both the highs and the lows. But we'll kind of be traveling around in the, the material in between there. Um, as well. The title of the sermon tonight is Too Weak Not to Pray. And since this is a Wednesday night meeting where there is a purposefulness with respect to prayer, it seems appropriate uh, for that occasion. Um, we see in King Asa uh, an example in verse 11 of what we should be, an exemplary example of that. And we also see him um, later on what we should not be in exemplary fashion. He started his reign well, and he ended it very badly. Unfortunately, that was not all that uncommon amongst the kings. He started in humility and dependent prayer, but he ended in stubborn self-reliance. So he is a cautionary tale. Second uh, Chronicles 14.11, and Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. And then when you flip over a couple of chapters to 2 Chronicles 16, 12, you see the sad ending. And Asa in the 30th, 30th and 9th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. So looking at the context here with, uh, with King Asa, Judah was not in bad shape, actually, when he took the throne. His father was decent as far as the kings go. He left the country in pretty good condition. And that's really important to note because it shows that it is possible to uh, trust in the Lord from a position of material prosperity, which really is something that should be a burning question for us. It's not very likely. But it is possible. Thank God for that. We live in tremendous material prosperity. And it's, it's not serving us well. But it is possible to trust the Lord in that. Uh, so I also started out well. The first several verses of chapter 14 chronicle his success. He did good and right in the sight of the Lord. He was a man serious about his faith. He was not a syncretist or a compromiser, hesitating between two opinions. He removed the foreign altars and some of the high places. He tore down the sacred pillars. He cut down the ashram and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and observe God's commandments. And the kingdom was undisturbed under him. For 10 years, there was peace, and he built fortified cities during that time, but he wasn't doing that as an alternative to trusting in God, which is always a great danger. His reasoning, in his own words, in verse 7, let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us because we have sought the Lord, our God. We have sought him and he has given us, given us rest on every side. So in Asa's mind at this point, anyway, trusting in God was not a rejection of instrumental means. When you fight battles, ordinarily you do it with swords and shields 
and bows and arrows and spears. <clears throat> so Asa wanted to make sure they were well fortified in the usual and ordinary means of self-defense. Verse 7 tells us that they built and they prospered. God was with them. Uh, he had a good-sized army, 300,000 men from Judah bearing large shields and spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin, bearing shields and wielding bows, all of them valiant warriors. It would have been easy at this point for Asa to rely on the fortifications, to rely on his army, their skill, the materiel, and to rest in that because he'd made so many preparations. But he did not do that at this point. It would have been very easy for him to say something like, we've heard, soul, you have many goods laid up for years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But Asa did not do that. And really, he couldn't do it because on his doorstep showed up a million-man army of Ethiopians with 300 chariots. And if there's one thing that will take your breath away, it's that. And put a dent in your self-confidence. So what did he do? Well, he didn't surrender. He didn't wave the white flag. He went out to meet the Ethiopian army, and he drew up in battle formation, and then he prayed. And I can imagine that his prayer was full of fear and trembling and fervency. And Asa cried, verse 11, Asa cried unto the Lord his God, and he said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether in, with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. There isn't any hint of self-confidence there. No false bravado, just fear and trembling. He refers to himself and Judah as them that have no power. And since he didn't have any, there was no basis for trusting in himself or in his army. And he could then have undivided trust in the Lord. He was too weak not to pray. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. There's not apparently an inward struggle here between trusting in his army versus trusting in the Lord. His army didn't give him confidence. 580,000 just didn't give him confidence versus a million. Oh, his army wasn't big enough. So he looked to the only one that was big enough, God. And isn't that where you want to be in your prayer life? That's where I want to be in my prayer life. Are we often bemoaning the fact that our prayers are lifeless and they're lacking in fervency? But notice how Asa arrived at this point of fervency in prayer. He didn't schedule it on the calendar. It didn't come by means of an accountability group or by self-flagellation. It was the fruit of his weakness and his desperation. He was weak and he knew it. That's the key. He felt it in his bones. And the stakes were high. If Judah would lose this battle, they would lose possibly hundreds of thousands of men. There would be hundreds of thousands of widows. They would become slaves, those who survived, including their wives and their daughters, and you know what that means. And Asa would be either killed or he would be turned into some kind of a zoo animal to be paraded around at festivals, a conquest trophy of Zerah, the king of the Ethiopians. So the stakes were very high. There are many reasons why we don't pray. We're too busy. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to say. We feel like we're repeating ourselves. We've said it already. We have no appetite. It's not a priority. We're undisciplined. 
and so on. And those things are real problems, and there have been many books written about those problems, and they're good and helpful. But what I want to focus on here is this issue of desperation or the lack of it. Desperation will swallow up all of those other problems in a heartbeat and drive the people to prayer no matter how undisciplined they are. A man in a leaking life raft, floating in the ocean, far from any ship, sharks circling about, will cry out to God with great fervency. He will not need an alarm on his smartphone to remind him to do so. He will not need to be cajoled or guilt-tripped into it. He will pray like he has never prayed before because there's nothing else to do. And there's no one else to call on except the Lord. And what we see here with Asa, and we see it over and over again throughout Scripture, is this desperation and how it leads to prayer. If you look up the phrase cried out, or any of those you know, cognate verbs, cry out, crying out, in Scripture, you'll find many instances of desperate prayer. And the word in the original is a word meaning to shriek as if from danger. And then over in the, the New Testament, in the Greek, it comes from a word meaning to croak like a raven or to scream. In Exodus 2.23, the Israelites were being oppressed by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh, and we read, and it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. When they were gathered at the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army hotly pursued them, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord." In Judges 10, the idolatrous Israelites were once again oppressed, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And it was desperation that made them cry out. When the Assyrians approached the gates of the city of Jerusalem with a massive invasion force and demanded that Judah surrender, Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet prayed about this and cried out to heaven. When Peter walked on the water toward Jesus, he made the mistake of contemplating the wind and the waves and all the reasons he shouldn't be doing this and why this shouldn't work. And then he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Bartimaeus and his blind friend were desperate souls because of their blindness and sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by and knowing this may be the only opportunity they ever get, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And many other examples could be given, and the common denominator in all of them is desperation. The cry of God's people in each and every circumstance, is the logical and natural thing. It's spontaneous, it's not planned. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for planned prayer meetings. We have them as well. I have planned things on the calendar for prayer. I do that uh, because I know I will dissipate my life away in futility and vanity if I don't schedule certain important things on, on the calendar. So don't misunderstand me here. It's important to note in each situation, God answered the cries of his people. He came to the aid of Asa and routed the Ethiopians. Bartimaeus and his blind friend were healed. Peter was lifted out of the raging waves of the sea. God sent an angel and killed 185,000 Assyrians, rescuing Hezekiah and Judah. Israel was saved from Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. And so there is reason for hope here. We're not crying to a pitiless God. Fervent cries ascend beyond the ceiling, and they reach heaven into the ears of the God of hosts. Amen. 
We all know what James 5.16 says. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And in each case here, what we have is fervency. Psalm 34.15 promises us, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. So, this raises a question. If desperation is really the need of the hour, and if it is what leads to fervency in prayer, then what are we to do? What are we to do if we're not desperate? We can't just summon it up, can we? We're surely not supposed to just parrot desperation. It ought to be genuine. <clears throat> Shouldn't be contrived. So how do we get there? I'm going to come back to that at the end, but first let's consider what happened to Asa after his cry of desperation, the great deliverance that he experienced when God came to his aid and he routed the Ethiopians. After that defeat of the Ethiopians, Asa and Judah went out and routed the cities of Gerar. These were Philistine cities that were in league with the Ethiopians. And out of those victories came the spoils of war and much plunder. 2 Chronicles 15 continues with Asa's reign, and it's a feel-good story thus far. The Spirit of God comes upon the prophet Azariah, and he goes out to meet Asa with a good and encouraging message from the Lord. He said, The Lord is with you while you be with him, and if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. So that was a hint. Azariah was telling Asa the Lord's predictable pattern. The Lord disciplines his people with various afflictions. He troubles them with various kinds of distress. But when they turn to him in their distress, he hears them and he helps them, just like with the Ethiopians. Remember that, Asa. Well, Asa did not remember it. Or it might be more accurate to say, Asa did not keep it in remembrance. For several more years, he did quite well. He made many good reforms. But then, then Asa like so many before him and after him, proved to be one who could not handle prosperity, at least over the long haul. So how about you? How have you handled prosperity? Years of peace and success did not bring Asa closer to God. He drifted away from God. The warning from Deuteronomy 8 was fulfilled in him. Remember, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. A new threat arose. Basha, king of the north in Israel, went and took Ramah, the city of the tribe of Benjamin, and he fortified it in order to prevent anyone 
in the northern kingdom from traveling down any longer to Jerusalem to worship there. So what did Asa do? Did he call on the Lord? No. He took treasures out of the temple of the Lord and used them to bribe Benadad, king of Aram, to break his treaty with Israel and instead make a treaty with Asa. And the terrible thing is it worked. I put worked in quotes. Benadad broke his treaty with Basha and attacked various cities in Israel, and then Basha had to stop fortifying Ramah. But you know, it's a bad sign when disobedience and faithlessness and compromise succeed. Amen. It is far better for us when God recompenses our disobedience with failure. Woe to you when your disobedience succeeds. Asa must have been proud of his ingenuity. A problem arose and he fixed it. No need to bother God here because Asa's got it under control. Enter Hanani the seer who came to rebuke Asa for his foolishness. And he said to him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Assyria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars." Asa did not humbly receive that rebuke. He did not repent and change his ways. He was enraged. How dare you say that to me? Who do you think you are? Have you forgotten how prosperous we've become under my leadership? You remember the defeat of the Ethiopians, do you? Well, do you remember all the good works and the reforms I implemented after that? Have you forgotten how faithful and zealous I have been for the Lord God? How dare you suggest that I've been unfaithful to the Lord considering my track record? And then he threw Hanani in prison. Well, this prophet faithfully brings the message of the Lord. He risks his neck, and this is the reward he gets. But Asa didn't stop there. Verse 10 tells us that he also oppressed some of the people at that time. So apparently his rage was not sufficiently vented upon Hanani. He had to take it out on a bunch of other innocents as well. And finally, we come to that verse I indicated was the summary of Asa's failure and the closing bookend of his life. 2 Chronicles 16.12 his faith in the battle with the Ethiopians was the apex of his life, and this verse marks the nadir. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. That's a sad end to the reign of an overall good king. Like so many others, he did not finish well. He would not humble himself before the Lord. He would not confess his sins and plead for the Lord's mercy, even when the Lord afflicted him severely. He spent the last two years in agony with throbbing feet, a stiff neck, and a hard heart. And his attitude seems to have been, I will try any Savior but the Lord God. I'll pursue any remedy except repentance. So he sought the physicians. Let's try some foot rubs, hot and cold treatments, some dietary changes, some physical therapy, whatever. But nothing works when your problem is God. And the only solution that holds out any help, repentance, is the one you will not tolerate. 
So Asa goes from the heights to the depths over the course of his reign. And we have to ask what happened here. How did he go from humble dependence on the Lord to proud self-sufficiency? I think the answer is one inch at a time. Imperceptibly. That's what's scary about it. Over time, his success and his wealth proved to be toxic for humility and faith. Prosperity is not the soil that faith grows in. Faith has to be kept in lively exercise or it atrophies. Amen. But how can you keep up a lively faith in the Savior if there is so many other saviors in your life competing for the job? So what about us? This isn't just a nice biographical sketch, is it? We need to ask the hard questions of the man in the mirror. I'm sure that we all want to be in the spiritual condition that Asa was in when he humbly called on the name of the Lord in total dependence when confronted with the million-man army. I'm sure we don't want to be in the spiritual condition we find him in at the end of his life. So how do we cultivate the former and avoid the latter? Is it even possible to do so? It's hard for the rich to get into heaven, and most of us in the West are rich. Amen. We have an abundance, and it's not helping us thrive spiritually. In fact, it's killing us. In Old Testament days, we see that God would bring affliction on his people when they were fat and happy. We see God humbling his people to wake them up to their need. But we don't really see people in the days of prosperity doing anything themselves to address the problem, and that's usually because they don't see the problem. I want to come back in a minute to what God is actually doing to show us our need, but let's just address this question first of what can we do to cultivate a sense of our own weakness and dependence. And I want to emphasize at the outset that I'm not here about to present some five-step plan. This is um, not one of those methodical things. If you follow this method, all will be well. It doesn't work like that. So there's two errors that we have to avoid here. We have to avoid the idea that God has done all he can do and everything's up to us. On the other hand, we must avoid the notion that because God must do the work in our hearts by his grace, therefore there is nothing for us to do. I think that the letter to the lukewarm Laodiceans is instructive. It's what God wrote in the New Testament to a situation just like ours. Revelation 3, 17 through 20, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Amen. He's rebuking and chastening them, means he loves them. Amen. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So here's five things that we have a responsibility to do, and they're all tied together. Put on eye salve so that you may see correctly. That is, apply the truth of Scripture to your eyes. You are not strong. You are a weakling. Resist the flattering lies of the devil with the truth. Drill the truth into your head and pray that God will help you believe it. You don't have to pretend to be weak. You are. 
You are weak. And so am I. You just need to believe that and live in reality, not a fantasy world where you are rich and wealthy and have need of nothing. Number two, buy gold and raiment from Christ. That is, acquire it without money and without price. What does that mean to buy gold and raiment? It means to lay aside the filthy rags of your own righteousness and put on the white robe of his righteousness. We'll be talking about that on Sunday. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Reckon yourselves poor in righteousness of self and reckon yourselves rich in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Consider how bankrupt you are apart from him and how rich you are in him. Think of yourself in this way. Put on this thinking. Three, be zealous and repent. Confess your sin of self-sufficiency. Confess the sin of an imagining yourself to be strong. Confess the sin of acting like you don't need God. Number four, open the door to a knocking Christ. Quit closing your heart to him. Open the door and be reconciled to him and renew your covenant vows and commune with him again. And number five, when it comes to money and wealth, Start giving it away. Your bigger barns are a stumbling block. Empty them and distribute the goods to those in need. There's no mystery why we don't have a lively faith in God when we're storing up money barns to trust in instead. And this won't be a one-time thing because God does bless givers, puts it back in. And so it's just going to be a lifelong giving out. So you'll have to keep giving. You'll, you'll get to keep giving. You'll make yourself to be a river, not a dammed up reservoir. How much money do we need to sleep at night anyway? Now that's what we should do. That's what we must do. And we must do it by the grace of God and in the strength that he supplies we must do it in joy, not drudgery, not in the mindset that these are meritorious works. They're not. But let's come back to this issue of what God does to remind his people that they're weak and in need of him. I think God is doing that for us. Have you looked around recently at our country and the state of the church in our country? America, as we once knew it, is over. It's over. But God is good. He is showing us that we need him. We don't need a strong America. We need him. We don't need the good old days of America. We need him. He is afflicting an arrogant, self-satisfied country and showing us how self-satisfied we are and how fragile we are. It is as if he has unleashed a thousand termites to chew at the trunk of the tree of this nation. And trying to politically solve the problem of the termites is a futile game of whack-a-mole. Where do you start? There is no politician, no president, no candidate who can fix this. There's the border. There's the $34 trillion in government debt, plus all the unfunded liabilities, plus all the consumer debt. There's rampant inflation. There's fentanyl, meth, heroin, marijuana, and so many other destructive substances killing hundreds of thousands of people every year. There's the destruction of the family. Sexual immorality, fornication, hookups, homosexuality, transgenderism, increased violence, 
the murdering of babies by the millions, the lawlessness, spiking suicide rates, the deep state, the corruption of elections, the erosion of the Bill of Rights, abysmal schools and universities, which are usually just indoctrination centers, woke corporations, DEI, ESG, diversity, equity, inclusion, environmental, social governance, all this communist things, fascistic public-private partnerships, that's the euphemism for fascism, public-private partnerships, threats from host, hostile foreign nations, the threat of civil war, the threat of digital currency, the foster care problem, the sex trafficking problem, and then there's the church, or what's called the church. False teachers, false churches, false brethren galore, shallow preaching, shallow evangelism, constant quarrels over secondary matters, false unity, and ecumenicalism on the other hand. So on the one hand, quibbling and quarreling and squabbling over secondary matters for which we should not separate from one another. And on the other hand, false unity and ecumenicalism. A church that looks little different from the world. And even in churches that are doctrinally sound, is there a prayer meeting? Oftentimes the answer is no. Right. If there is a prayer meeting, is it anything more than a gossip session? A chance to talk about other people's problems. Or is it just an exclusive focus on health problems? Is the preaching a searching kind of preaching that makes a beeline for the heart, or is it just information for the head? Is there church discipline and a concern for the purity of the church, or is the church utterly leavened? Are the pastors and elders shepherding the souls of the congregation or just preaching sermons to them? Not that there isn't shepherding involved in that. But this is a salt that has lost its saltiness. And Jesus said that that kind of salt is good for nothing. It's not even good for the manure pile. The only thing you can do with it is throw it out and let it be trampled underfoot by men. So the point of all this gloomy synopsis is that God is judging America. Right. And he has started with the church, mm -hmm. the household of God. And this is not going to be pretty. The situation is desperate. But this is good because God is showing us how weak we are. Amen. This is our Ethiopian army moment. This is not a million-man army of Ethiopians breathing down our necks. This is a million demons breathing down our necks. Amen. Is this not a cause for fervency in prayer? Is there no basis for desperate prayer? How much worse does it need to get? The lifeboat is sinking. The sharks are circling. And there is no one else to call on. There is no help coming from any, anyone else. It's God or it's, it's over. It's lights out. prophet told Asa that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Or to put it another way, God is looking for a few weak men Amen. and women. Weak in their own eyes. Men and women who do not think they are strong and have need of nothing. But men and women who know they are powerless to do anything. And since they are powerless, they must look to God for help. Are you weak enough for God to show himself strong for you? 
When we are weak, then and only then are we strong. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are a marvel. Things are completely unraveling around us. A nation is in shambles. There isn't a lot of time left. And um, still, there isn't the kind of desperation in our prayers. There's not the kind of desperation in my prayers that there ought to be considering the circumstances. Oh, Lord, help us open our eyes. Help us to see that we need you. Help us to not just sort of wait out the clock and um, sort of bide our time until, until it really comes unglued, until we're afraid to walk out our doors in the streets. Pray that you would uh, help us to call upon you, help us to feel our need, snap us out of it, wake us up, bring smelling salts in front of our nose and bring us to Thank you for coming to the aid of those who call out to you, Amen. who cry out to you. Amen. Thank you for being so merciful. That you were merciful to the Israelites in the days of the judges is a wonder. It's an astonishment. Their provocations were breathtaking, and you had mercy on them. Lord, how much more than for we, your new covenant people, your law is written on our hearts. Yes. We, we call out to you in our need. We have no strength. We have no answers. We have no strategies. We are not hoping for November to 2024 to fix all these problems. Amen. We look to you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be exalted in our weakness. Mm. Come to our aid for the sake of the people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brethren, would you please stand with me for our benediction. Brethren, we do not want the birds of the air to rob us of the seed that has been sown. Many of us here are certainly in tune with the things that we heard this evening. And I do pray that that will not slip away from us. Sometimes we must have as dark a picture as the scriptures will paint so that we will know that the light of the world is Jesus. All right. May God take what we have heard and bear much fruit from it. Our benediction is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. Let us go in the name of our blessed Savior. Amen.